Welcome to Experience Life Today. I'm Ruben E. Golf. It's good to be with you today. And as you evidently can see, coming right here to you, around the sanctuary of Mount Calvary Tabernacle. And boy, there's a message coming your way. And I know it's Sunday morning here, but it is a Wednesday night message. Preach this called the forerunner. And uh, we're going to use an illustration that that word forerunner was taken from uh, actually a maritime word uh, out in the sea. And, and I just can't wait to hear this. It's going to be encouraging to you and be uplifting. So stay tuned. Quickly, though, I want to tell you about uh, the tragedy that you have heard about in the last uh, couple weeks that happened in the Philippines. As you know, we've interviewed them here, right here in the sanctuary. I think it's been twice at least. And it's Clint and Janeth Taylor. They are uh, the missionaries that we support, Experience Life Today, and the church here as well supports them. And we work in conjunction with them. Wonderful, reputable, good, godly people do a magnificent work. And they are with Missionaries to Asia. MTA is the acronym. I would ask you, if you want to help, you can punch in Missionaries to Asia. Spell the whole thing out, missionaries to Asia.org. You will see the pictures, the videos on there, and you can help them online. I want to quickly tell you this. Clint told me this personally, $100 will support a family with food for four weeks, a family of five. A family of five Filipino folk for, for four weeks, $100. If you would want to donate, go right on to missionariestoasia.org. There's a tab on there. You can do it yourself and take care of it. And, and I tell you, they're going to be very appreciative. You'll be helping a family for a month if you give them $100. But any donation is fine. So God bless you for your giving. Pray for them over there. We'll see you on the other side. God bless you. I'm excited about it. I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Paul, here I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews to a Jewish congregation. That's why you get so much of the understanding of the abolition of the law, the transition into grace. And don't make the mistake that the law was evil. It was not evil. Uh, Paul makes it very clear it was not evil. It was good. It was holy. The law was holy. It has its purpose, still functions in a purpose and its principles. And it leads men to salvation. Basically what the law does was actually kills a man, <laughs> proving his uh, need of a Savior and leading him. The problem with the law simply is this, that it cannot bring life to anybody. It only condemns. It only is a power of judgment. It only has the power of a decree of a death sentence, and that's it. It cannot legislate life, and that's why Jesus came. And thank God for Jesus. Amen? And that is why he he said he didn't come to destroy the law. He said, I've come to fulfill it, and I have come to expire it, and he did. He put an expiration date on it, and every one of us, the moment we went through the cross, the law became expired in our life, and it was removed over our lives, and life was given in exchange. Isn't that good? I'm glad that we're born again tonight. Amen? And I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 6, and I want to begin with verse 16, if we may. We are revisiting those of you here in the congregation, those of you watching by television, you will notice that yes, I did preach a message on the anchor holds. And we're revisiting these verses here. And this is a night service. You'll see it on Sunday morning. Uh, but uh, I've done a little bit more reading and something more has come to light that I think would be encouraging to you as a believer. Uh, and also it will be enticing to a lost soul. It will create and hopefully we can create a thirst and a desire in somebody who is wayward, who doesn't know Jesus Christ, that they can have a life <laughs> that is way more fulfilling than now. And I'm not talking about filling the vacuum of emptiness with money or more things or materialism that will never be achieved by those things. Thank God there's something more fulfilling than material substance. It is a spiritual substance. And the Bible refers to that substance as the bread of life. And the bread of life, much like bread in the physical realm, satisfies the body, but it only can do it for a little while. And a few hours later, you're hungry again. But thank God Jesus can satisfy us. He is the bread of life, and he is the fulfillment for our lives. Now, look at verse 16. 
16 and chapter 6, verse 16, and let us read together. I wasn't going to read as many verses, but they are in context, and so it does give a little better clarity. Ready? For men... Read with me. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Look at verse 17. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise. Listen, who is the heirs of promise? Are you an heir tonight? Amen. You're an heir, according to Romans 8. And let's read on. The immutability of his counsel. All that means is immutability. Uh, simply means unchangeableness. It is an unchangeable quality. And this is always saying that his counsel, purposes, plans is not up for debate. It is unchangeable. Then he says he confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, unchangeable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie. Now right there ought to make us almost stand up and shout and thank God we have somebody we can depend on who does not, cannot, and doesn't even have the capacity to lie. Amen. Amen. I, I'm sorry. I, I, well, I, well, I'm not really sorry. I don't even want to say that. I'm not sorry. I'm, so, I'm, I'm just going to say it. Uh, boy, uh, I, wish, uh, I wish God was in our Congress and in our White House. <laughs> I don't know what, well, any, I've got, I better move on because I get in there, we'll never get out. But isn't it amazing how, how, you know, it's one thing to tell a subtle lie, none of it is excused, but it's getting to the point now, it seems like politicians are lying <laughs> and, and it's so blatant that they're lying, but they don't care if you know they're lying. <laughs> Is am I telling the truth? It's, it's getting horrible. But thank God we have another government, and it's the government of God, and in his government, there's no lying. <laughs> and he won't try to sell you an insurance policy on a lie. Amen. He will tell you the truth. When he said, by his stripes, you are healed, you can take it to the bank. There's no small print underlying it. Amen? And so thank God for a God who's truthful. It was impossible for God to lie. We might, let's read on, we might have a strong consolation. Look at that. He doesn't just say a strong consolation or, or just a consolation or a consoling, a strength, an encouragement, a comfort, all of that is basically uh, that word consolation made up as a composite of all of these words. Uh, my we, Not just a little strength, but we have a strong power. We have a strong comfort. We have a strong consolation. And so he says, who he's, he's specifying who it is, who have fled for refuge to, laid, to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Let's read that again. Ready? Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the who? The forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I was, I was going to do something a little different, but I think I'll do it this way. I, I want to show you, as I studied the word forerunner. Now, Brother Matt, I want you to come up and uh, get ready. I just sit in the front row right here. I'm getting ready to move you into a room, I think. Uh, you, when you look at that word forerunner, I'm going to get my rope back out. We're going to show you an illustration here. When you see the word forerunner, obviously, and it does mean that, it means somebody who has went before. And that is the surface meaning and applicable right here in the context and in this verse. But when you begin to excavate anything in the Bible, especially for teaching purposes, you want to dig out all of the nuggets and all of the truths that are contained in a scripture, oftentimes that you have to go back and go back 2,000 years, get back in time a little bit, set yourself down, reopen your eyes, 
eyes, so to speak, in that travel journey and open it to the cultural setting of the time. Also to take it back and live in that time of civilization and look through the eyes of the New Testament or Old Testament writers of that moment and, and, and get a vivid picture of what they were relating words to. And oftentimes, as you know, with Jesus using parables, he was likening it to their culture and their time at that moment that they would easily uh, be able to have their mind wrap itself around in comprehension to exactly what he was dealing with in a spiritual truth that had depth to it. But he would elevate uh, it to a place of understanding to them, to the unknowing mind, by relating it to something surfacy on the physical side of this planet. And it was a very, a matter of fact, it was the best way of um, teaching. When you read here, Paul is no different. He uses the word forerunner. What I begin to find, though, that as I wrote a blog this week, I had a blog this week, the word forerunner has a rich history in the maritime world. I never knew this. I've always just skimmed right across that verse. Thought, well, it's just one went ahead of us, and it is. But when he was talking about this, their culture would have a very vivid picture, illustration in their mind, what he was talking about, and it took it a little deeper and had a little bit more of an impact on the here in the church, this Jewish church. You see, what would happen is, now, now uh, let's pretend we're, we're on a ship. <laughs> and this is the ship over here, Connie. We're on this side here. Let's take it up to the edge of the, this part of the stage here. And this, this is our ship. And we're in this boat. And at that time, they doesn't do it nowadays, but back then, this is what they did. And in the night, if they arrived uh, into the harbor area of a port or in the harbor area of that shore, uh, uh, that ship would come only so close. Now, they could not in the darkness see the actual shore, but they knew by their own instruments of that hour and that day, they knew where they was by sinking fathoms or get a fathom depth. They actually had those at that time. Very primitive, I might add, by a string if you, if you take it to that way. And, and they, would, they would actually find, that's why Paul would say in the book of Acts, it was so many fathoms deep. They would know that by... By dropping it down in, they would do the figuring just like we do here in the cistern, here in the church. Now, uh, as they're getting, they know they're nearing the shore, but they, they can't see the shore. So what they would do is they would take a small boat out of the existing ship, <laughs> a little skiff, if you might say, and they would uh, literally attach. I don't have an anchor here, but I want you to pretend there's an anchor attached to this rope. Back then, they didn't have big steel cables like they do today uh, on the anchor, but back then huge and heavy ropes and they would tie it onto that anchor. What they would do is they would put the anchor in and also notice ships then was not near like they are today and those anchors could be handled by a man or at least by two. They would set the anchor down in this little boat lowered into the water. One man, usually one seaman, would get in that boat and begin to row towards the shore. Now, there would be a rope attached to the anchor and to his boat. Lots and lots of slack, unbelievably, an amount of rope was given for him to make it all the way to the shore out there. Now, what would happen is, now, Brother Matt, I want you to come here, and I want you to take this rope. Now, we're going to pretend he's the seaman. He is now called the forerunner. And that's his label in that maritime world. They called him the forerunner. What was he doing? Well, we can't make it to the shore in this ship. All of us can't go. It's, it's, we can't navigate it with the ship because there's rocks, there's reefs, there's things there that could destroy us, and we don't have the ability to navigate in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to send a forerunner ahead of us. And now, if you would, Brother Matt, I want you to go in this door and stand behind the door. Now, don't make faces at us through the window. But anyhow, now you hold tight on that. Now, I'm going to pull on it probably a little bit. Now, <clears throat> Now, the forerunner goes in there, and he's in there making faces, isn't he? <laughs> but anyhow, anyhow, he goes on ahead and takes out the slack of that rope, all right? Now, here he is, and he's the forerunner is now made it to the shore. Now, what's he do when he gets to the shore? He lit, now, I read this. It's an old historical fact. He takes that anchor out, takes it up on the shore, and he finds a good lodging place, digs it in, and 
puts it down and puts it in, and there it is lodged on the shore. Now, the rest of the night, listen to this, they, this these ships had sails, and they, they, they would unfurl the sail, or actually take the sails down, and they would literally, through the night, they would not go to the shore yet. They would stay the night on the end of this rope, and that anchor would hold them until the morning light. In the morning light, the sails were not out, and now what they would do is they would begin to winch themselves towards the shore and by this big rope, and they would go, and that anchor would be holding. Notice, they are not doing anything by the wind or the sails or anything to get there. It is all dependent on the security of the anchor. If the anchor dislodges, they're adrift back out into that water. But what they do is, little by little, they just keeps winching all day long. They winch themselves and winch themselves until they pull themselves in to the shore. Now, when you read this verse, I'm going to show you something with Brother Matt in a minute, and he's going to become Jesus to us in just a little bit. Now, uh, the, the implication spiritually is forerunner. Jesus went into the innermost part of that tabernacle, into the inner veil, and now he, the anchor, becomes the forerunner, is personified, and now it is Jesus Christ who is our hope. Can somebody say amen? Now, we can't see heaven from where we are. We live in a dark world, and we can't see heaven with our physical eye. But we are tethered. Jesus went on ahead, but he has attached to us something known as faith. <laughs> My faith is tethered to the anchor of Jesus Christ over on heaven's fair land. I don't see Jesus. I don't see the forerunner, just like the ship couldn't see him either. But one thing they had was a rope that was attached to the anchor and they held it on and had it on a winch in their ship. Every, the, 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 the longevity of that ship throughout the night or holding on and not being adrift all depended on the power of this rope that was attached to that anchor. And this is how important it is to us. We're living on this earth in a dark place but our faith is tethered to Jesus Christ. And every day we live, every act of obedience that we perform. Every decision we make that falls on the side of the principles of God's Word, every day we move a little bit closer to the shores of heaven's land. Every day we're moving closer. And you know what's going to happen? Go ahead and open that door, Brother Matt. And one of these days, you step on out if you want, one of these days we're going to pull on that rope one last time and we're going to step out into the arms of Jesus Christ who's waiting on us on the other side. That's what happened to the ship at last on that day daybreak was there and they're winching in and all of a sudden now they can see the forerunner ahead and when they pull onto the ship or pull onto the shore all oh, arms is out boy I tell you did a good job we're all safe and sound now because of you navigating through the night it is the same way with Jesus Christ aren't you thankful he navigated through the rocky reefs he navigated through the shipwrecks he navigated through the storm he navigated through the darkness and honey he made it to the other side and honey he overcame so we can overcome too as long as we don't become distracted and let go of the rope. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Thank you, Brother Matt. You see, I'll let this lay here. I'm going to use it a little bit more. The, the number, you've got to realize, Satan, it is impossible for him to move the anchor out of the holiest of holies. There's nothing Satan can do. He, he's tried it. One third of his angels have tried to unseat God originally. Uh, he, he's tried to keep Jesus from making it there. When Jesus sat down on the right hand of the Father, the anchor of our soul sat down in that innermost sanctuary of God in heaven. There is no devil in hell that is able to dislodge the authority, the power, the stability, and the grace that he sits in that place place. There's nobody can make him move at all. If anybody's going to move, it will be us, not Jesus Christ. He said the immutability of his counsel. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never change. He said in Malachi chapter 3, I am the Lord and I change not. Politicians may change. Jesus never changes. 
I tell you, you see, he has credibility with us. You see, we are attached by faith to that wondrous person of Jesus Christ. That's what links us to Jesus Christ is our faith. That means that our faith is the most important substance in our lives on this earth. You see, faith is the substance. It is the substance of those things. It is a reality. People say, hey, I am amazed at Christians who will say, well, I, you know, this is reality. I live in a real world. I live in reality. What's that mean? Living a Christian spiritual life isn't a reality? Honey, I want to tell you something. Reality is just as real in God's realm as it is in this realm. <laughs> you see, all along the way, what happens? The enemy uses distractions to loosen our grip of faith. You see, distractions can, <laughs> now notice this, is to create, what's, it, what's his purpose here? At the moment we're on that sea of life, we're holding on to Jesus Christ. What is Satan doing? He's trying to get us distracted away because I am always to be looking towards the shore. I'm always to be looking under the author and the finisher of our faith. That means my spiritual gaze is always on him. What is Satan trying to do? He's trying to get around us and distract me from looking at Christ, look at a situation, and have failure in my life. What he wants to do is let go of the tethered line to your soul and set me adrift into the life situations of this lifetime. Amen? This is what he's out to do. And so we have to be careful. That's why Peter, as long as he looked at Jesus, walked on the water. Because his faith remained tethered to the anchor and, but the moment he looked away, he got distracted, he dropped the rope to Jesus, and our own self-ability cannot withstand the powers of evil. We can't overcome them in our own flesh. And he sunk right down to his neck level, and thank God, even in the midst of failure, he cried out, said, Jesus, save me. He picked back up the rope again. The rope held, the anchor held. He pulled him back up on the water, and they both walked back to the boat together. As long as you hold on to Jesus, you'll walk on top the water. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Satan operates in a realm of destruction. You see, we can be very good. We can be very, listen, uh, a distraction does not happen in the body. Distraction happens in the mind. I can be very good at not allowing our bodies to physically unite with anybody and everybody we meet. Now, we understand that. I'm, I'm not trying to uh, elicit uh, all kinds of imagery here unholy. I want you to see this. We, we're very good. Christians are very good at not uniting their bodies to everybody they meet and coming down the road. Uh, yet, but even though they may not do that, they can become very promiscuous in their minds. We need to be the same way about our minds that we are about our bodies. We need to protect what this mind thinks on. And that body, we do good. Well, that body's not uniting with everything out there walking around. No, but the mind has to, has to be as well, remain tethered to the mind of Jesus Christ. What holds us in a, in a disciplined thinking is our mind is tethered, just like that rope, to the anchor of our soul. When we allow our minds to unite with any and every thought, we become very promiscuous with their minds. And I'm not talking about just sexual thoughts here. I'm talking about anything that's wrong that we connect our mind to. We take a thought and we attach ourselves to it. Now we've got a problem. You see, we shouldn't be thinking on things that are promiscuous or those things that are perverted. We are to cast down imaginations, take every thought that exalts itself against God, take it captive, imprison it, and throw it out of the mind and say, devil, you're not getting a foothold in here. Well, it's all right. My body's not connecting to something sinful. No, but let's don't let the mind connect to something sinful either. Amen. We've got to keep our minds tethered to Jesus Christ. He said, let, Paul said, chapter 2 of Philippians, let this mind be in you. <laughs> let this mind be in you. Allow it. Permit this mind. I want you to turn to John 21. John chapter 21. And verse, well, we can start with verse 1. I was going to go to 3, but John 21. <clears throat> John 21, verse, well, let's start with 1 and go down to 3 anyway. 
After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, a Sea of Galilee, and on the wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus its twin, and Nathaniel of Cain and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Now, read with me verse 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, What's he doing? Well, he doesn't try that once. They say unto him, We also go with thee. No, 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 well, we have to be careful of our words, don't we? What if Peter would have said, I think I'm going to pray? I wonder if the rest of them would have said, we're going with you. I wonder if he'd have said, I think I'm going to, of course, at that hour they'd have had the Pentateuch. I wonder if he'd have said, you know what, I'm going to break up, I'm going to break open the word of life. What if they'd have said, I think we'll do the same. You know, instead, he says, I'm going fishing. And they said, we're going with you. That's the power of words and friendship and relationship. Yeah. <laughs> just a little side note there. Just think about that. Let that sink in. See, we also go with him. You know, it's, it's also amazing. This is what Peter and some of the fellows did before they were saved and before they were called to leadership and apostleship and as a disciple. <laughs> You see, going back, and, and you're going to read here, and they caught nothing. See, going back to the old life, <laughs> you reap the same thing as they did. <laughs> Are you here? Yes. Going back, to, you see, when Jesus got us out of the old life, we found out there wasn't anything there. <laughs> But isn't it amazing, after a while, we're holding on and holding on, and something distracts us, gets in our mind, and people let go of that rope, and they'll go right back to where they were before they were saved. And you look at their life, and they're having the same results as they did before they were saved. They caught nothing then, and they're getting nothing now. So that old life is not worth it. Why are we here? Why are we just even spending any time? I'm, I'm trying to drive a point home to us that no matter the circumstances of life, there's nothing worthwhile letting go of Christ to go back to. Satan will try to generate feelings, emotions, and imagery in the mind to somehow make it look like a shiny trinket, and that's all it is, and he'll make it look like gold, but it's just brass. Look, you had it better here, or it will be better there. Just let go of that rope to that anchor inside the veil and then things will get better. It is a lie because the moment I let go of it, I'm tossed and I'm overwhelmed in the circumstances and I go back to being an even worse than what I was before and one day I'll wake up again realizing, why did I do it again? I found out the first time there was nothing here and now it's even worse than before. You see, <laughs> He says, go three times. Now, now i got to get down to this. And he said, we also go with thee. And, and I want us to also remember that. Just keep that in mind. People, even sinners, they'll not admit it half the time. But you know, if you live a holy life before others, many times you have earned their respect and they'll honor you. And they'll look up to you. <laughs> And when you speak something, they begin to trust it. And that's why we've got to be careful of what we say. I will even tell you that amongst young Christians, older Christians have to be careful what they say. Because what you say will do just like it did here. I'm going fishing. Mm, didn't think of that. I think we'll go too since you suggested it. It's called the power of suggestion. McDonald's knows this. I asked them at one time. They, every time you pump the drive through, it, it isn't just, hi, can I take your order? What do they say? Hi, welcome to McDonald's. Would you like to try, uh, what is that thing called? A frappe today or something. I even got to, I shouldn't tell you this. I even got to imitating it when they would say it. And they, as they were saying, I, I said, I frappe today. And well, I got tired of hearing it, okay? But anyway, and I asked a girl one time, I said, why? Why don't you just take my order? I don't want a frappe. I didn't want an apple pie. And I wasn't being smart with her. I said, I don't want any of that. And, and she says, well, what it is, she said, it's called in advertising the power of suggestion. She said, believe it or not, it works. People will pull up and never even give an apple pie a second thought. She said, but when it says that, I said, oh, yeah, I think I will, too, for a dollar. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, words have an ability to create a hunger or a thirst. I go fishing. Why did they say that? Our leader's dead. Our hope is gone in their own mind. They weren't paying attention. They didn't understand. Three days later, he, he already told them that. But in their mind, they would, became distracted by the circumstances and couldn't see beyond it. Not that they couldn't, they refused to. <laughs> Amen? And so as a result, they left go and they began to be set adrift in life. And as a result, things were not going to go very well. Now, <laughs> now look over as a result of letting go. You see that something happens, and he says, cast the net on the right side in verse 6 of the ship, and ye shall find. And, and, and I mean, it's just when you go back to an old way of living, you'll do, old, you'll do wrong things. Wrong living produces wrong things. So when you get back right with God, you get back on the right side, and you start doing right things. You have two different harvests. Now, as he's doing all of this, they're having a fish feed. I want you to turn down now. Look at verses 15. Uh, on down through 17. Notice here what he says. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said to them, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. You know what's going on. Three times Peter denied him. Peter did not know what the reaction of Jesus was going to be when he saw him for the first time after the resurrection. After this thing had happened, he didn't know what the reaction was going to be. He knew he had really goofed. He had sinned. He had denied his Lord. You can't really get much worse than that, denying your own Savior. I mean, actually, that's worse than what Judas did. So that tells you Judas could have been saved if he just called out and got over his pride. Okay, instead he committed suicide, which is a foolish waste of a life. He didn't have to do that. And, but Peter denied. He was worse than that. He denied uh, outright that who Jesus was. And so now Jesus is coming back, and he says, uh, Simon, and that word love there, phileo, he just simply says to him, uh, do, do you love me uh, not the way that I love you, Peter, but do you love me as a friend? Do you just simply love me as a friend or a, a kind of a, a phileo love? And he said, then he says, oh, well, you know, Lord. And he said, well, feed my lambs. And then he says in 16, look at that. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. Then verse 17, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. Because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, and knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, you, you, now take notice there. Now, the English word remains the same as we've learned here in years past. The word uh, lovest is the, is the same word in the English, but it's not in the Greek. The first two times, lovest is phileo. The last time is agape. What Jesus said in verse 12, uh, 17 was, All right, third time. This is what grieved Peter. He said to Peter, now, I'm going to ask you one more time, son. <laughs> Do you love me the way that I love you? The first two times, you, he says, Do you love me in a humanistic kind of way? You're just a friend. The third time, he says, all right, I'm going to ask you one last time. Or, Do you love me? That's agape love. That's God divine type of love. It's self-sacrificial. It is the only kind of love that basically is, is what exists in the relationship in salvation. I want you to see it's not just a phileo. It's not eros, not any of the humanistic terms. Agape is the only one reserved for the divine relationship. And he says to Peter, uh, do you love me the way that I love of you. And finally, this tore at the heart of Mr. Uh, Peter. <laughs> he, he, was, he was crushed by this, and he said, you know. Then he says, then feed my sheep. Then in verse 18, he says something very interesting. He said, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself, walkest whether thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and others shall gird thee and carry thee whether thou wouldest not. Notice, I'll break that down, give it to you in our, our, our common language. Uh, basically, he just said to him, uh, look, he said, when you were young, uh, when, <laughs> when you was like that, you clothed yourself, and you went where you desired to go. In the last part of that verse, he said, but something is going to change because in the latter part of your life you're going to go somewhere where you do have not intended on going. You're going to go places you would not have went out of your own desire. But listen, when God gets in your heart, you go places where maybe you wouldn't have desired to go, but God
God has a plan for your life. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And when we, listen, this is what he's, he's coming right down the basis of this. Je, Jesus is telling Peter, look, if you, you're going to love me the way that I love you. When, when you love me the way that I love you, you will do things for me that will sacrifice yourself. See, Christianity isn't all about personal creature comforts. Sometimes God will take you places you would have never chosen to go. And I'm not talking sinful things. I'm talking about getting out of a comfortable zone and going and doing things in a daring way, in a daring mission where God is saying, you're going to go somewhere that's going to require you to love me like I love you. In other words, it's not my will, but thine. <laughs> and come on now. You see, there are times, listen, there are times in our lives we are tethered, we are tethered to Christ, and we're on that sea of life, and we're slowly winching towards the shore, and we'll find ourselves in the swells of life where we didn't create the problem, but we got washed up into somebody else's problem or created by society or whatever, and <laughs> you say, my goodness, I, I think I'm going to, no, it's no use to let go. Hold Hold on to Christ. Love him like he loves you and endure because there's a hope coming in the future. Amen. So many times in church, people are willing to throw in the towel because something just got a little rough. It's something called life. We need to love Christ the way he loves us. Come on now. I mean, it, it, we, listen, we don't love Jesus as just a buddy because when times get rough, you know what some friends do? <laughs> they depart. <laughs> We have to love Christ the way he loves us. See, anything, let me just, boy, I got, I got more here to go than I thought I did here tonight. You see, anything, this is why John said, he must increase, but I must decrease. This is why death is the perpetuation of life. This is why the grass dies and gives life to the cow. This is why when the cow dies, gives life to us. Anything, when we die, not physically, but when I die to myself, I now give chance of life to somebody else. As long as I remain alive, absent of Christ in myself, then everybody around me will die with me. <laughs> Are you see what I'm saying here? You see, as long as I'm on the job and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to behave the way I want to behave and I'm going to talk the way I want to talk, I'm going to cuss the way I want to cuss, I'm going to do this the way I want, and I don't subject. That means I'm alive, and that means everybody around me is going to be fed the death that is in me. But when I come to the cross, I die. Life comes up into me. Now I love Christ the way he loves me. Now because I died, life is going to come into that job all around me. And when they're watching me on the sea of life, it's not me who lives. It's Christ who lives inside of me. And that life in me is going to get in somebody else. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, it's Wednesday night. We're supposed to be behaving, but it's all right. We'll, get, we'll, we'll act like it's Sunday night. Is that all right? Thank you for no amens. I want you to look over. Let me transition here a little bit and give us a little bit of keys to victory that I have over on my other little thing here. But you know, uh, one thing we should all learn is that in this walk of life and in this being tethered to Christ, we'll never make it to the other side without discipline. <laughs> Don't shout me down now. <laughs> It'll require discipline to get there. You say, what do you mean Discipline. Discipline actually gives birth to healthy spiritual habits. I hope you get this tonight. Even when you take discipline back all the way to when we were children. Today, we're not to discipline children. We're to let them find their own way. As a result of that thinking, children are insecure today. Discipline actually produces security in a child. See, we, we, the world, they can't figure that out. They don't understand that. They don't understand that a backside, <laughs> all right, 
I'll take the hits here. Just go, you just say amen. Uh, the backside getting a good spanking. See, things in the world does not work in the spiritual end. They don't understand that. But God said there's something wonderful that when a child is spanked, it actually produces security. It does. Why? The Bible says to the spiritual children, whom he loveth, he chasten, or he disciplines, or corrects. When God corrects us, he says it's proof, I love you. When I realize he loves me, I feel secure. When mom and dad discipline children, it's all oh, they weigh on, carry on, goof off, and, and, and say, oh, mommy doesn't love me. See, that's that sinful mindset. But down deep inside of them, it produces a security. They realize when they get older, mom and pop loved me. Huh? How many of us? Now that we're older, not at the moment, and now that we're older, well, I sure do thank the Lord for them spankings I got. I thought mom or pop would have shouted amen on that. You see, and Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into salvation, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He said, I keep my body under subjection. I discipline it. Why? He had a hope of a future. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, an athlete, why does an athlete discipline their body with a, with a, with a regimen of workouts? Because when they're in the contest, whatever it is, running, uh, marathon, sprinting, or whether it's in football, it doesn't matter what. Because when they're in the middle of the contest, they want to be sure the body is going to respond at the moment that it's needed. Why do, why do we have spiritual disciplines? I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> we may not know the hour or the day, but very soon there's coming a temptation, there's coming a trial, there's coming a test, there's coming a satanic attack, and I've got to be sure that my spiritual man has been disciplined enough that when I call on that, it's going to be there when I need it the most. Yeah. That's why we have spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting and reading the Word on a daily basis. That's why we spend time in the presence of God. And that's why we develop our relationship. That's why we deny our bodies every little thing that it wants that may be in, out of correlation with the Word of God because there's coming a day of temptation, a trial, and adversity. And I don't want to lose my tethering to the anchor of Jesus Christ and be set adrift on the swells of life. I want to hold on to Jesus and say, Lord, I was built for such a time as this and the power of God being resident as a result of the discipline and the habits of life. And at that moment, when I call on that spiritual man to rise up and resist the devil, he will flee from me. This is why we need this in such an overpowering way. You see, I need to know how to, uh, because the disciplined individual, moral and spiritual nature comes alive and it overcomes that evil. There are some things, and I'll just close on some of these things. What is some spiritual discipline? Number one, we ought to discipline our conversations. <laughs> We ought to learn to discipline the way that we talk. I am not in the thread of just simple positive thinking or simple positive speech and, and, and etc. But I will tell you that a faith-filled heart is a result of a faith-filled mind that is also going to demonstrate itself in faith-filled conversation. And faith-filled conversation will be positive and not negative. Our conversations literally becomes the wheelhouse of our soul. What we say is like words going out ahead of us, providing points and pinpoints of, of, of direction of where our life is going. Our tongue is very powerful. But we've got to guard our heart because what we say is going to lead the way. <laughs> 
Are you here tonight? And so we've got to be careful. People that is always speaking negative, people that is always, they lack discipline with the Word and with the relationship with Jesus Christ. We can read the Word, but if we don't truly believe it, if we only read it for intellectual growth and not spiritual life, then we'll lose it in our conversation because we won't talk it, we won't speak it. We just feel it's good enough to read it. But honey, this Word has been made to leave the page, get inside the brain, get inside the heart, and then reveal itself in an action being produced by the Holy Spirit. I need discipline in my life. Disciple is the root word of discipline. <laughs> what was Jesus teaching the, the disciples for three and a half years? He taught them the spiritual disciplines of the government of God. <laughs> One of them, <laughs> two of them failed. <laughs> One of them doubted. <laughs> Praise God, uh, 11 out of the 12 made it to the end. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? They saw their leader, they saw Jesus pray every day. They saw Jesus when they went to him and said, how do you have this kind of power opening blinded eyes? How do you have this kind of power that one who hasn't never talked in his life can do it in an instant when you touch him with your hands? How, how, how does a man like Lazarus walk out of a tomb? How does a widow's son out of Nain rise up out of a coffin and come back to life? How does a little 12-year-old Jewish girl get up out of a bed of sickness and they give her something to eat who's now died, but now she's come to life? How in the world can you walk in the pool of Bethesda and read down and touch a man, grab him by the hand and he leaps and rejoices and who was crippled for 38 years is now made well. What is the secret of your power? And Jesus basically told them, it is found in the discipline of prayer. They took notice that man would pray all night long and go out and touch the multitudes. And they said, there's something up with this man called Jesus. He said, I'll tell you what it is. I have a, I have a tethered relationship with my God the Father who is in heaven, and I'm going to forerun this thing, and you imitate the way I do it. Amen. We've got to be careful and we've got to avoid words. Here's words that really we have to be careful of. I'm not talking uh, positive thinking overnight, but I'm telling you the Word of God is positive. We've got to avoid negative words such as, I can't. Oh, I, I just can't. I just can't. The Bible doesn't say I can't. The Bible says the opposite. The Bible says I can do all things, not in myself, but through Christ. Who does what? Strengthens me. Not my power. No. But my spiritual faith is in the anchor. He provides. I believe him. He releases power into me. I'm telling you, that rope is like a highway of faith. I believe in him. My faith goes to him. His power comes to me. I believe in him. His virtue comes to me. Shh. Glory to God forevermore. I tell you, the longer you walk in faith, the more convinced you are not to let go. Right. <laughs> Do you know the longer you walk with Jesus, the more the realization you get to that it's not me? <laughs> Boy, the worst thing in the world to do is after you're out there on the highway or out on the sea, I'll say, whew, man, I am all that. <laughs> Boy, I want to tell you something. The moment we do that, it's the moment we lose that, just like Samson did. Samson got to thinking, well, it is me. Boy, I am. I'm a powerhouse. Well, I don't need God. He left go of the rope and found out he ended up in a grit meal with his eyes gouged out. Got to be careful of those things. Discipline. See, Samson lost discipline. And, and another, one said, another one you'll say, uh, somebody said, well, I'm weak. Well, I'm weak. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. <laughs> See, this does away with all of the, uh, this does away with all the supermarket market Christians. How are you doing today? Oh, I just feel so weak. How are you doing? Oh, I just feel like I can't go on. Well, oh, I got another one up here. I know you're going to like this one too. How many, how many has ever here said, well, you know, the word fail. Well, if I didn't, boy, I tell you what, if I, how you doing today? And owl number six. How you doing today? Well, if I didn't have any bad luck, I wouldn't have any at all. <laughs> it ain't about bad luck, good luck anyway for a Christian. See, that's just a woe is me thing. 
You know what has happened? They become distracted by the devil and they're losing grip on their faith. And it won't be long. See, see what happens is we get weak and we'll start finding fault with everybody. And then basically we turn on God. What do you mean? Oh, I don't hear that. No, no. Rarely do you hear somebody say, oh, I tell you what, I hold that against God. But see, we are all cre created in the similitude of God. We're created in His image. When we hate one, uh, if I hate Brother Butch, I'm actually hating God. Not that he's God, but if I can't love somebody who I do see, you know the rest of that verse. And how can I love someone? God is the inference being made. Then how can I love God who I can't see if I can't even love somebody I do see? This is why the devil hates people so bad because we're created in his image. Every time he looks at you, he sees an image that resembles God. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came on Wednesday night? If you shout real loud, we'll even have church tomorrow night if you want. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I can do all things. Listen, let's discipline our reading habits. I mean, be sure to set and don't let anything rob it. Spend time reading the Word of God. Because why? Faith comes by hearing. Yes, in church, hearing. But it also implies well, you need to absorb it in a personal level in reading it ourselves. A person who don't read the Bible is somebody that will not activate faith because it's not produced by it. That's the engine of faith. You see, you can't have a true, victorious, happy life apart from the daily intake of the Scriptures of the Lord. You see, the, the law of, listen to what David said here in Psalm 37, 31. He said, the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. If you don't want to slide away from God, get the word hidden in the heart. The only way it gets hidden in the heart, you've got to get it. Amen? So, <laughs> let me, well, I'm, not, I'm running out of time. And he, we just got started on this aspect of it. Also, whatever else you read, make sure it edifies you. Don't read things that's going to take away from your spiritual experience. I'll just leave that as it is. Discipline your prayer life. I've got to quickly move on. But discipline your prayer life. Stay in constant personal contact with God. Be sure you're always on speaking terms with Him. <laughs> always develop a prayer life. Don't fall into just a regimen of simple rote or regurgitation of the same thing continuously over and over and over. Always keep yourself afresh in the, in, in the time of prayer. Doesn't mean you don't say some sa same things uh, daily. I do, you do, yes. But keep it afresh every day. There should be new things coming into that prayer time all the time. Amen? Uh, discipline, here's another one. I've got to hurry. But discipline your friendships. I said last week, discipline your friendships. The most important person physically, I'm not talking about Jesus, of course, is the most important person in your life. But the most important human being on this planet to your life is the one who feeds your faith. You know who the most dangerous one is? We learned it last week. You remember this. The most dangerous person to your life is the one who steals and robs and takes away your faith. Discipline those friendships. If somebody is always taking you down, get away from them. I'm, I felt good saying that. I'm going to say that again. If, if somebody is always dragging and draining you, it's time to get away from them. <clears throat> well, I love them. Oh, sure, love them. Well, I better not get that out. <laughs> I almost goofed here. Uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes people need a correction. 30-year-old 30 children who are still draining mom and dad needs the apron strings cut. Amen. Just cut it. Oh, I love them. That's right. That's why you love them and show you love them by cutting the strings. Well, they, they're on my couch every day and they're, I'm afraid they're going to starve to death. And, and, and listen, uh, they need to get a job. And don't give them another bone of chicken and mashed potatoes until they do. Okay? The Bible's very clear. If they don't want to work, don't feed them. 
What? <laughs> Pastor, you're mean. That's Bible. He said, don't <laughs> discipline yourself. I mean, dis you know, and anything you watch, listen to all of that, just discipline yourself. Uh, another one here, discipline your, oh, discipline your church attendance. Thank God for the Wednesday night crowd. There's no, there's no problem with that here. But, you know, we need to discipline our church attendance. Church attendance is very important and is a very important discipline to our lives. I am amazed at people thinking that church attendance doesn't mean a whole lot. Actually, according to the Bible, church attendance is vital to our existence. Amen. Boy, it's getting weaker and weaker. I was just talking the other night, I don't know if his brother died, somebody, and it's, no, it was the girls, I think, and it's true. In church attendance, there are things personally, on a personal level, God is going to reveal to us in our private prayer life and our private reading. He's going, to, he's going to bring things to us. But there is still the need of the five-fold ministry gifts on that pulpit. Evidently, and it's true over and over, that through the ministry gifts, there's something you're going to receive that you'll never receive without it. Thank you for no amens. If because if that's the case, then why do we need five-fold ministry gifts? Why do you even need a preacher? That's right. If that's not the case, so there's revelation that's going to come from here we'll never get on our own, even our own individual relationship. That's why we need to come to the house of God. Because how many times have I heard people leave and say, I've actually had people say, you know what? I wouldn't even come to church that day, that morning, that night. But boy, I'm so glad I did. Because when I, when I was there, God spoke directly to me. All right, here's the question. What if you wouldn't have come? Huh? Been hurt? Yeah, you wouldn't have got it, wouldn't have received it. What if those people, what if, how many one or Sunday morning said to themselves, this past Sunday morning, might have said, I don't think I'm going to church, but they got here and God spoke twice specifically to several individuals in this congregation. What if they wouldn't have been here? They would not have received it. Amen. It's very important to be in the house of God. And I'll close on that discipline as well. You know, never let a barroom junkie be more dedicated to their house than we are to this house. Amen. Why does a bar room, why does a guy go to, the, I was just talking about this the other day. Why does a guy go to the bar? I've seen them. I have visited them. I've frequented them. I know uh, many times the guys that was in the bar room, their wives hated it that they were there. When they got home, they were going to face her wrath. But as a result of being in the bar room and all the other fellows in the same boat, they actually drew encouragement from one another. And when they would leave the bar said, boy, I think I can face her now. <laughs> Why? Because of the camaraderie. Because of the, the friendship. Said, boy, I got a friend there. And they got encouraged. And when they would go home, they'd face her, get depleted by the end of the night.